The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve Americans and America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business, on which so many of the Equitable Society's nearly four million members depend for their livelihood. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to people who personally own some part of the business enterprise in which they are employed. For such owners... This commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information of great importance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Gridiron Swindle. The first thing a newspaper reporter learns is that in order to write the lead on a story, he must supply the answers to five questions. What, where, who, how, and when. Because special agents of your FBI and newspaper men are both investigators, it is not unnatural that the members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation should be able to answer those questions with respect to crimes. In order to help them keep their answers up to date, your FBI makes periodic surveys of the crime situation, one of which has just been concluded. The study reveals many shocking facts, with perhaps the most shocking being the fact that in the first six months of this year, the number of larcenies, a number which includes swindles, amounted to more than 277,000, or more than 1,500 every day. Should those figures fail to impress you, should you feel that it's much ado about little, then perhaps you might be interested to know that the loot taken by criminals in those larcenies represented cash and property valued at more than $17 million. Tonight's file opens in a second floor room of a hotel located in a large Midwestern city. A young man is pacing the floor nervously while a lean, gray-haired man sits in the corner sipping a cup of black coffee. Well, you did it. You really did it this time. Wally, I've apologized in every way I know. If I could, I'd, I'd give you the money back. I'll try to deposit that in the morning. Who's that? Me. Oh. What are you doing home so early? Tell her, Uncle Ed. An unfortunate accident occurred, my dear. Uncle Ed, you've been drinking again. Drinking? You should have seen him with the sucker. What happened? We're supposed to get the sucker drunk. Uh huh. Instead of that, your dear Uncle Ed would get so plastered, he starts to lift this guy's wallet and falls right off his chair. Mm, I don't understand it. I was sitting firmly on the chair, and all of a sudden. You were sitting firmly on cloud number seven. Well, stay up there if you like it, but don't hang around Charlotte and me. From now on, we're traveling light. Wally, I. I don't like to call attention to my past kindnesses, but if you remember. I gave you a car when you got out of reform school. A stolen car? Wally, you... You obviously don't appreciate the sentiment that was involved. I also gave you your start in this business. Oh, now, look, I've heard this routine a hundred times. It's true, Wally. You keep out of this. But, Wally, he's my uncle, and I'm not going to stand by and have you just kick him out. Oh, all right, all right. We can argue about that when we get home. Right now, we've got something else to worry about. What's that? How do we get out of this hotel without blowing our clothes? Oh, that's a relatively simple matter, my boy. All we have to do is take the sheets from those beds, tie them together, and let ourselves gently but firmly to the delightful terra firma below. A few days later, in an FBI field office, Special Agent George Watson is approaching the desk of Agent Jim Taylor. Hi, Jim. Hello, George. 
Back from court so soon? Yeah, I'm going in to ask the SAC if I can have some time off. I don't think you'll get it, George. Why not? Because he's already assigned you to work on a new case with me. Oh, what's this one about? Well, we received a teletype from the sheriff of a small town named Hudson. It's about 300 miles from here. I know the place. Oh, well, he said he was hanging around the gas station when a car pulled in to fill up. Uh-huh. One of the men in the car seemed a little drunk. As he got out, he walked over to the sheriff and asked him if he had any ice in his pocket. Oh, oh fine. And in his conversation, he mentioned to the sheriff that they were coming here. So? Well, after they left, the sheriff couldn't get the old drunk's face out of his mind. He knew he'd seen it somewhere before, so he went back to his office and checked through the FBI files. Sure enough, there it was. Who is he? His name is Ed Garvey. I don't know him, at least by that name. Well, he's been a confidence man for about 40 years. Well, they change their names so often, I, I guess I never ran across him. Well, there was another man and woman in the car. The sheriff found a flyer on the man. His name is Wally Billings. He and Garvey have worked together in the past. At what? The old lemon pool swindle, you know, where they get the victim to take cash out of the bank, get him drunk, and then pick his pocket. Uh-huh. I had an alarm sent out to every local police department between here and Hudson. How long ago? A couple of hours ago. Come on, let's walk down to the teletype room. Okay. Maybe they've been caught by now and you can get that time off. Ah, uh, good morning, my dear. Good morning, Uncle Ed. Where's Wally? He went out. He's still mad at you. Because I got out of the car and discussed generalities with a stranger? You didn't have to pick the sheriff, did you? Charlotte. I was partially a man of distinction at that moment. I didn't notice that the gentleman was an arm of the law. Well, Wally had a right to be mad. Well, he isn't any longer. I've mended the breach. You mean you made up with him? Yes. How? Oh, I gave him a very commercial idea. It's a little thing based on the current national hysteria over football. Oh, that's nice. Where is Wally? Uh, he had a date. Mm, with whom? A uh, Mrs. Cornelius Hines. Who is Mrs. Cornelius Hines? Well, Wally said she was a big society lady. He's building her up for something. He said it looked good. Mm, that's fine. Uncle Ed, are you going out? Uh, yes. Well, Wally said to make you promise one thing. What is that? He said to ask you not to get drunk. Charlotte, you know I never drink when I attend the sport of kings. Are you going to the races? Yes. But you have no money. My dear girl, those racetrack trains are very crowded. And in a jostling mob, it is a well-known fact that uh, wallets are very likely to slip from one pocket to another. Well, goodbye, my dear. Ah, this is certainly a beautiful view from here, Mrs. Hines. I insisted on the tent house. I think if you must live in the city, you should at least be able to look down on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Another cup of tea, Mr. Billings. Oh, no. No, thanks. You're probably wondering why I called you. Frankly, I am. Well, I read about you in the papers. I also read about your pet charity. Oh? Charities happen to be my business, Mrs. Hines. I'm a professional promoter. I raise money for charities and charge a percentage. I see. I have a feeling that I could be quite useful to you... Well, I never have used high-pressure tactics. Oh, this isn't high-pressure, Mrs. Hines. I have a means of making money for your charity that will have the public clamoring to give you money. Really? Take a look at this. What is it? Those are football games this coming Saturday. Yes? People all over the country buy these cards for from $1 to $10. But why? They try to pick winners. If they do, they win. And if they don't? They lose. <laughs> of course, more lose than win, so the people who sell the cards make money. Oh. So if we sold the cards, we could raise a couple of thousand dollars for your charity every Saturday. Well, that sounds splendid. Think you'd like to try it? Well, You I... can get society girls to sell them for you. That would really make them move. Now, uh, what do you say? Mr. Billings, I... I think I like your idea. Call me in the morning. <laughs> Jim, any word yet on Billings and Garvey? No, not yet, George. How about giving their pictures to the newspapers? Maybe we can smoke them out that way. I thought of that, George, and the SAC put thumbs down on the idea. He's afraid it'd scare them off. The old man, Garvey, is pretty slippery. He doesn't draw the line any place. Why, do you know he once sold a hard-shelled businessman a bridge across the Missouri River? What? Yes, he convinced this man he was from the Department of the Interior. 
And that as a defense measure, in the event of war, the government was going to tear down the bridge and build a tunnel. Oh, no. Oh, yes. This man was in the scrap iron business, and he sold him the bridge for $16,000. And in cash. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Sergeant. No, no, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Hmm. Page seven? Yeah, I'll get a copy right away. Thanks very much for calling. George, is that the journal you brought in with you? Yes. Oh, can I see it, please? Sure, here. Hi. That was Sergeant O'Rourke down at police headquarters. Said there was a picture on page seven that might interest us. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, look at this picture of the horse that won the big race yesterday. Oh, let's see. There. There's our man Garvey practically weighing in with a jockey. Well, that proves he's living here, Jim. Yes. Now let's see if we can find out where. <laughs> Where are my shoes? I put them away. Wally told me. Uh, where is he now? I don't know. He just said he was going out. And for me to see that you didn't, he can sit and talk to me. Uh, no disrespect, my dear, but that happens to be my idea of conversational solitaire. Uncle Ed, what's this big idea you gave Wally? It concerns football. But how? <clears throat> Have you ever seen a football pool card, Charlotte? You mean where you pick winners and get odds? Exactly. Is that the idea? Yes. Well, what's so great about that? Ah, the variation I thought of. With our cards, every player must win. Why? Because we take close games, and we give 20 and 30 points to the player. <laughs> Not even a moron could lose. Then how do we win? We sell the cards in the sweet name of charity. And then, well, well, you know the saying, charity begins at home. Oh, must be going good. Look, Wally put this out of the paper this morning. It's a picture of Mrs. Hines selling the first football card to the mayor. <laughs> so they've even got the mayor going for... Say, Charlotte. Huh? This, uh, this woman in the picture. She's Mrs. Cornelius Hines? That's right. Hmm, get my shoes. I can't. Do you want me to go up in these bedroom slippers? No, but Wally said... I, I can't do it, Uncle Ah, uh, I see. I have no choice then, Charlotte. I bid you a fond adieu. Where are you going? To pay a call on Mrs. Hines. Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte. I'm in the living room. Oh, well, get out the bottle, baby. What happened? I talked to Mrs. Hines this morning, and she told me the cards were almost sold out. Oh, honey, that's wonderful. Uh, Where's Uncle Ed? Well... uh, Uh, Call him in. We'll all have a drink. He's not here, Wally. But I told you not to let him go out that door. You couldn't stop him. If he went out and got drunk again in broad daylight, I'll break him. He didn't go out to get drunk. He went out to see Mrs. Hines. What? He saw her picture and he went to see her. Let me get that phone. If he does anything to spoil this deal, I'll murder him. I worked for a week on this dame and I finally got her on... Oh, hello. Hello, please connect me with Mrs. Hines' apartment. Thank you. Finally got her on the hook. Hello. May I speak with Mrs. Hines, please? Hmm? Oh, it's you. Well, let me talk to Mrs. Hines. I want to tell her... Hmm? Who? But... But... He hung up. Who hung up? Your uncle. He done it again. What do you mean? Mrs. Hines ain't Mrs. Hines. Huh? She's an old friend of his. But she's a society lady. She's a larceny dame called Society Mary. And she and your uncle are using our football money for our honeymoon. We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. This was the problem that confronted Mr. James Shanahan, president of a large contracting company in Texas. When those two boys of mine came out of the army, they signed up to work for the old man. And they've really taken hold. As far as I can see, there's only one cloud on my horizon. What's that, Mr. Shanahan? Well, those two boys of mine have really pitched in. 
But they've still got a lot to learn. Can't expect them to pick up any 30-year know-how in three years. Now, uh, say I get killed in an accident tomorrow. What happens to my business? Mr. Shanahan, every day, trained representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society are helping business executives solve problems similar to yours. Well, I'd really be interested in hearing a sound and practical suggestion. Well, it might be something like this. The Equitable Society business insurance specialist would probably recommend a substantial amount of insurance on your life, payable to your company. This sum would make it worthwhile for key employees whom you trust to stay with your sons. Or it might be used to hire a first-class man from the outside. Strikes me as a step in the right direction. How can I get the whole story? An Equitable Society business insurance specialist will be glad to sit down with you and your associates and discuss business insurance. He's fully qualified to work out a plan that's tailor-made for your business. Have your secretary call the nearest Equitable office and ask for the manager. Or dictate a brief note to the home office of the Equitable Society in New York City. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Gridiron Swindle. In one form or another, the axiom that truth crushed to earth shall rise again has existed almost as long as man himself. Unfortunately, the same thing might be said about falsehood. And as the, we trust, late Adolf Hitler proved, falsehoods repeated often enough soon begin to be accepted as fact. One of those untruths that has always permeated our everyday speech is the fallacy which says that there is loyalty among thieves. As you have seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that is a simple and unadorned lie. Criminals, and especially those who are confidence men, live their very lives using deceit and treachery as their everyday accomplices. To expect them to possess in abundance a quality which goes hand in hand with decency is as illogical as to expect a one-month-old baby to stand up when the national anthem is played. If criminals have a single common quality, that quality is not loyalty, but greed. Greed which fuels their everlasting search of something or nothing. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Tellings and Garvey have done it again, George. What do you mean, Jim? I've just been over talking to a girl named Bettina Franklin. She called the local place first, and they told her to call us. What about? Well, Billings gave a Mrs. Cornelius Hyan some football pool cards. You know, the kind where you get odds for picking a certain number of winners? Yes, I've seen them. Well, Miss Franklin said that Miss Hines arranged for her and 50 other girls to sell the cards throughout the city. Mm. They sold quite a few of them. And every one of the cards was a winner. How could that happen? Well, here's one of them. Take a look for yourself and see. Okay. Anybody could pick winners. They've got Notre Dame, a 20-point underdog. That's right. Same thing with Michigan. And from what Miss Franklin says, Mrs. Hines has disappeared. You suppose she was in on this swindle? I don't know, George. I called the Daily Mirror. They're sending a messenger over with a picture of Mrs. Hines. Ah. In the meantime, I've sent one of the leftover cards to the lab. As soon as we get a report from them, let's try and find out where these cards were printed. I can't tell you how happy I am. I'm so glad. Ah, fate is a merry prankster. To think that just this morning I was a veritable prisoner. And now I'm speeding across the country, cozily confined with my radiant bride. (laughs) That's a little flowery, dearest, but keep on talking. I love it. (laughs) Ah, Mary, my dove. Do you realize how many times in the past we almost got married? It ran into the dozens, didn't it? Ah, it was the most frustrating, I can tell you that. Every time I would be in a position to plead for your hand, you were either married to someone else or confined to the Bastille. Uh, darling, a couple of times you were legally detained yourself. Remember? Ah, too true. Ah, it'll be fun being in California. I've never been out there before, you know. I was there. My first husband took me there on our honeymoon. Oh, I wish you'd told me that before, my dear. I'd have taken you elsewhere. 
Why? Oh, because you'll have memories. What memories? They arrested him as we pulled into the station, and I went on the honeymoon alone. Oh. Hmm. Well, I trust no such vulgar occurrence will interrupt us. Uh, let's drink a toast, my dear. To what? To my niece and her husband for being nice enough to pay for our honeymoon. <laughs> Word yet from the lab on those football cards, Jim? Oh, I'm just reading the report now, George. What do they say? Well, they sent us these two lists. What are they? Well, the cards were printed on stock manufactured by the Charleston Paper Company. Uh huh. This is a list of every print shop in this area that buys from the Charleston Paper Company. What's the other list? Oh, the uh, lab also identified the type used on the card. It was manufactured by the National Type Founders Incorporated. Uh huh. Now, the second list carries the name of every print shop in this area that uses National Type. I see. Well, all we've got to do now is cross-index these two lists. That'll give us a list of the print shops that carry both Charleston paper and national type. Uh-huh. Then we'll split that list and start checking to see which one of the shops printed these cards. Hello, Wally. Don't hello me. What's the matter now? If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be in this jackpot. What? I wanted to throw your uncle out five years ago. But he's not going to get away with this one. You can bet on that. He's not? No. What your dear uncle doesn't know is that I know where he's headed for. Huh? I went over to Mrs. Hines' apartment and told the superintendent I was her brother. And he told you where they went? No, but he let me into her apartment. I ransacked the joint until I found what I wanted. What was that? This piece of paper. What is it? It's a copy of a telegram your Uncle Ed sent to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles. What for? To reserve the honeymoon suite. Where did you find that? In the waste paper basket. Then maybe he didn't send it. He sent it. I checked. How? I called the Hotel Central. You called Los Angeles? Yeah. And they got reservations for Colonel and Mrs. Edward Garvey. So we're flying out there. I never knew Uncle Ed was a colonel. Don't you remember? He appointed himself the week he was being assistant secretary of war. Sorry I'm late, Jim. That's all right, George. I just got here myself. Mrs. Hines lives in the penthouse of this building. I'm hoping we can find some clue. And she was mixed up in it. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it'll be better if I give you all this in sequence, huh? Okay. I just learned that Mrs. Cornelius Hines has quite a criminal record. Uh-huh. She came to town about three months ago, posing as the widow of a Texas oil man. She wormed her way into so-called society by throwing a couple of lavish parties. Apparently, she was using the build-up for larceny purposes. Sounds that way. Did you get anything else? Yes, when I finished collecting information on her, I went out to check on my list of print shops. Uh-huh. The fourth place I went to turned out to be the one that printed the cards for Billings. They gave me his address. I went there, but I just missed Billings and his wife. Too bad. Oh, I had a search warrant, though. I went up, looked through the apartment. Mm-hmm. I found a clipping of a picture showing Mrs. Hines selling the first football card to the mayor. The mayor? That's right. I called Mrs. Hines from the Billings apartment. Found out that she'd left early this afternoon. And with a man who answers the description of Ed Garvey. Oh. Come on. Let's go inside and see if we can find out where Mrs. Hines and Garvey went. Okay. If we can find them, I've got a hunch we'll get all of them. Well, Mary, this is California. With all this fog, how can you tell? Hmm. Uh, I guess that's room service. I'll get it. Hello, Colonel. Huh? Out of the way, Uncle. Uh, Mary, we have some guests. Oh, it's Mr. Billings. That's right. Uh, how did you find us? Never mind that. You know what we're here for. Get up that dough. Edward, he seems quite insistent. You better give Mr. Billings his share. Are you kidding? No. You're entitled to half the money. Uh, she's right, Wally. You don't think I'm going to split with you now, do you? That was our original agreement. I made that agreement before you two grabbed the whole thing. Mr. Billings, we were going to mail you your share. Oh, now stop it, will you? <laughs> Expecting somebody? Uh, room service. That's who I thought it was when you came. Okay. Answer the door, but don't talk. All right. Wally. What? You never introduced me. Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Hines, this is my wife. I couldn't be happier. Uh, Wally, I'm afraid you're not going to get that money now after all. Why not? Sir, you might as well introduce yourself. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? I have warrants here for the arrest of all of you. What? But we're on our honeymoon. Well, the honeymoon's over. Now, you'll please come along with me. Ed, what can we do? Uh, the only thought I have at the moment, my dear, is to seek a co-ed prison. Uh, 
Mr. and Mrs. Billings, along with Edward Garvey and the woman known as Mrs. Hines, were all convicted for violation of the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to ten years in a federal prison. The clues which led Special Agent Taylor to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles were two in number. The first was that he learned from the apartment house switchboard operator that only one telephone call had been made from the apartment of Mrs. Hines. The charged slip showed that that call had been to Western Union. A check of the Western Union records revealed that Ed Garvey had sent a request for reservations to the Hotel Central in Los Angeles. Special Agent Taylor then flew to Los Angeles with what results you have already witnessed. Like most confidence men and women, the people in tonight's case worked hard to avoid detection. And had the special agents of your FBI been careless or allowed themselves the luxury of getting discouraged, these people might have succeeded in escaping. However, careless investigation plays no part in the work of your FBI. And every special agent is taught as part of his basic training that to become discouraged is fatal. Ninety-nine clues might prove fruitless. But there is always the chance that the next one will be the one that leads to the solution to the arrest and conviction of another segment of America's criminal population. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business, from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payroll. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a trained business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A thrilling, factual story of an elusive manhunt. Its subject, murder. Its title, The Man Who Died Twice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The man who died twice on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.